I want you to tell me where all the action is. Now, over the years, 42 years to be exact, I've worked with student clergy. 42 years of pastoral ministry. Yes, thank you for asking. I started when I was two. Uh, 42 years of working with all kinds of young men and women who have a passion and a calling to say, I want to change the world. I want to bring about awareness. I want to awaken their lives to the greater truth. Let's get out there. I want to preach. I want to teach. I want to be where all the action is. Let's change the world. And quite often I would say, I love your zeal and enthusiasm, but let's begin with prayer. 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 We're going to sit time and pray. There's things to do, Pastor. We've got to get out there and teach. We get out there and preach. We've got to go march. We've got to protest. We've got to resist. We've got to speak out. We've got to do all we can and to change this world. And I said, yes, 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 I agree. But it begins with prayer. Prayer. You think prayer is going to change the world? Oh, yes. You see, when we understand that the real action is, it's found in the power of prayer and all that it means for our hearts and our lives. Because quite often, if we're not accustomed to the power of prayer at work within our lives, we may not have experienced it to its fullest and understood it in its completeness. All that prayer does within our lives, because we don't believe this. Sometimes we've not had that transformational experience that actually can bring about change within the world, for all change begins within us. It starts right here. If we're going to facilitate change in the world, if we're going to be those that usher in a new world that creates a created world that works for everyone, not just a few, we're going to do all of that. We've got to start with us. We've got to start right here in our own individual hearts and our lives, because that's one of the greatest change agents we have in our spiritual journey. I love the fact that we are spending time in communion, connection, relationship with the divine. And as we allow that to flow in, through, around, and ever for us, we do facilitate the power of change in all kinds of ways. We kind of laugh at those who may say, you know, oh, there's all kinds of challenges in the world. There's all kinds of crisis in the world. Oh, you're in my thoughts and prayers. Was, what? We need to do more than just thoughts and prayers. What good are thoughts and prayers? How many of you have heard that? A lot of people complaining because we express thoughts and prayers. And quite often, well, we think that that's just foolishness, silly things. And that really is not going to bring about change. We want action. Ah, but prayer, thought and prayer brings about the greatest action within our lives when we understand it. It can be one of the most powerful things where we understand that every thought shapes things. Thoughts shape things. Thoughts are creative. When we understand that, how important it is that we've engaged in thoughts that are creative and shaping our world, molding and making it. And prayers are simply those expressions, those affirmations of these thoughts spoken in a positive and affirming way. And when we do this, thoughts and prayers become one of the most powerful things that we can do to facilitate change in us and change in the world around us. Thoughts and prayers not to be taken lightly, but very powerful. Now, I grew up as a preacher's kid in a very fundamentalist congregation, a congregation that is, was fir firmly a biblical literous context and so for them, this congregation, this society, this culture, this tradition that I was in was one that was not very welcoming of people who were gay. As a young man growing up, my father was my pastor. And here's my pastor, my father, telling me that God is not comfortable with gays and lesbians. In fact, God finds it to be an abomination. God would throw up, he would say, at the mere thought of a gay person. There I am sitting in the pews thinking, Dad? This God that you're teaching me of, this God that you're speaking of, now would say, oh, you're disgusting. I want to vomit. I want to throw. I found you to be an abomination. Well, that confirmed I must not be gay. I must be something else then because I knew God within me loved me. I felt the love, the presence of that divine energy, that universal love surrounded me at all times. And that's what became so confusing to say, how could I be gay? Then I must not be gay. I must be special. That's right. I'm just special. I'm going to say that because I may see the world a little bit differently than others did, but somehow that must be it because I felt the love of God. 
As I grew up in that environment, it became ordained in the fundamentalist context. Preaching and teaching, uh, there was this inward struggle that says, somehow, I don't know what to understand with my specialness. What do I do with it? How do I do it? Because that specialness looks more and more like being gay than being just that special. You see, it's not all that special to be gay. It kind of wasn't very normal for me. What do I do with this? I can remember praying so earnestly, God, make me the man you want me to be. Thinking, certainly God wants me to be straight, apparently, to my church and culture. I would pray that prayer so many mornings. God, make me the man you want me to be. Make me the man you want me to be. Make me the man you want me to be. And suddenly when I just felt the presence of God slapping me across the face and said, would you shut up once and listen? I felt this on a Sunday morning, 6 o'clock. I'll never forget it at Bethel Assembly of God, Youngstown, Ohio, where I was pastoring. I was in the sanctuary all by myself, and I began to say, God, I need to tell you, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. And Spirit says, so? And I felt this holy so, like suddenly I was listening to God, and I would be quiet, shut up enough, to hear, to hear the voice of God. And suddenly when I did, I began to realize that that prayer had been answered a long time ago. God had already made me the man God wanted me to be. I was living out as the man God wanted me to be. That prayer was done. It was over. Capiche, move on. Go on to something else. But you know how often it is within the world of our lives, we're just so busy. We're talking at God. We're talking to God. We're unloading to God. And then there's this moment when we just suddenly realize, wait a minute. Prayer is this wonderful relationship of being in full awareness of the divine. Maybe I need to be quiet and listen. Maybe I need to be quiet and hear and learn and understand. Because when I was ready to listen, suddenly I discovered prayer had already been answered. How often it is within our lives if we would be still and know, as Scripture says, as the great teachers and sages of all time begin to invite us to this wonderful journey of just being still, being still. And it's amazing what you will know, what you'll learn, what you'll experience, what will unfold for you in the midst of silence. Things that you may have not have known that you knew. Things that may have been uh, challenging for you. But to hear this rising up in consciousness within you, this divine awareness unfolding for you in this great stillness. It's there that you discover some of the wonderful things that God has always been trying to unfold within your life. But you've been too busy talking at, talking to, trying to unload all these wonderful things that we think are so important with God. Here's the thing, when we say thoughts and prayers are a wonderful way to change our world, we have to remember that it's not just fleeting thoughts. It's not just, oh, yeah, that's nice, or, oh, that's terrible, because sometimes we embrace all the world's challenges, and we have thoughts about it, and we entertain those thoughts, and we think, oh, things are so bad. Those thoughts we entertain, we hold dear into our hearts and our lives. Oh, the world has gotten to be such a terrible place. Oh, there's so many crises. There's so many injustices. There's so many places where it's unfair in this world. There's so many th famine and all these cr crazy crime and all these other things. And our thoughts become filled with that versus the thoughts of the highest and best, the thoughts of be beginning to see and experience all the good that, is God in, that God is wanting to do in our lives. So thoughts and prayers are powerful. Thoughts that are creative, creating what we desire are powerful. So we then say, yes, thoughts and prayers ushers in change, but it's thoughts of the highest and best. We've launched this expectancy year of saying we're living in expectancy. That's our foremost thought, that no matter what's transpiring in our day, our first thought is I'm living in the expectancy of the old good. Now that's powerful and brings in and ushers in amazing transformation and change in our lives. Because you may going through, you may hear the news, you may hear the, the uh, media expressing all kinds of challenges in our world. You may hear all of this in conversation around the water cooler, but you constantly live in expectancy that your first and foremost thought is something good is happening right now. Something good is unfolding through whatever I'm going through right now. 
I am in living in the expectancy that something amazing is unfolding. Now, when we think that, and that's our thoughts, then our prayers are also affirming that which we think, right? So our prayer is, I am claiming the highest and best for every scenario. I'm claiming the highest and best in God's presence to unfold within my life right here and now. You see, that's the expectancy that we live in that's so transformational. You see, those thoughts that we have have to be thoughts that are righteous. Righteous. What's righteous? Kind of a big spiritual sacred holy word that we kind of like, where do we use this word righteous, you know? Uh, sometimes it becomes a slang word and say, ooh, that was righteous. But I'm talking about righteous being right thinking. Right thinking. How important it is that we understand that right thinking comes to us in those moments when we learn. How do we learn best? When we listen. How do we listen? In the stillness and the silence. This is why we're such strong advocates of uh, um, encouraging people to a journey of meditation and prayer, of learning the power of being in the stillness. Something that's very foreign to so many in, in Western tradition is being quiet, being still. We are in a very ADD world where we're constantly thinking, thinking, and mind chatter is going constantly, and conversations are going nonstop. And we are these kind of people that are so caught up in this busyness of the energy of thought and consciousness and voice all experiencing all at once that silence sounds strange, uncomfortable. But it is in the silence that we begin to listen and we begin to learn and begin to know. How do we think right? How do we think correctly? How do we think in the way that is our highest and best? And if we don't quite understand, then we go into the silence, into the stillness, and we allow the spirit to speak, to teach. As we listen, we learn. We understand then how it transforms our thinking and our journey, our decision-making process, of what we believe is right and good and what we think is the highest and best. It's transformed by these moments of the silence where we've listened to that inner still voice that speaks to us. Right often we go into that if times of prayer, people will say, and we're so busy telling God our views, our ways, our thoughts, instead of allowing God to say, but the universe is speaking this way. What is this? Let's just try this for a moment as we listen for a moment to this very thought. Listen to this word, these words, and how do they resonate within you? If the voice of God is saying, I am love. I am love. I am love. And we hear this. Notice that God didn't say, I'm loving. I'm a being that's loving. I'm simply love. What love is, is God. That which we call the higher power, the highest and best, the divine source, is simply love. Love is that divine essence, that infinite possibilities, that wonderful power and presence that we seek to awaken within our own lives. God is love. I am love. When we experience that, we feel that. And then we listen to that very thought. Love. And now, if I am love, and I, the revelation of God, am love, what is the proper way to think? What is right thinking? What is righteous thought? What is thought that brings about the highest and best in my own individual life and experience? We begin to understand, and we begin to understand that this love pouring in us, through us, and around us, and for us then changes our every thought. When we think about the least of these, those in need, we think, wait a minute, how would I want to be treated if I were that person? Because I am love. And how is love going to be demonstrated? So our thinking changes. It shifts. As we are in the stillness, we understand the teaching. We understand the voice of the eternal echoing down through the ages of this power of love. This is, this is the thought process that is righteous, right thinking, high consciousness that falls within our hearts and our lives. We understand that then things begin to change for us. Because every kind of change happens to happen within 
you know how it is when we experience change that happens without, and people try to bring change to our lives from without? What do we do? We naturally rebel. Like, we don't like any kind of change that someone implements on us, forces on us. We're just not good change people as humans. We're not comfortable with change, especially when it's been brought to us from the outside, forced on us. We hate, well, this new law. I'm not going to like this new law. I rebel against this kind of process or this way of thinking, or I don't want this put on me. Or a... And then when we begin to think and we start from within and we embrace the divine love at work, we begin to see the rationale or the understanding that's possibly there for us. And change begins to happen. I find it very interesting that, you know, people want to argue on Facebook in our world today about lots of social issues. Has anyone ever been changed by a Facebook posting? Never. I don't think in the history of lifetime from the Stone Age as the caveman chiseled on the wall. I believe this and so-and-so is an idiot and they're stupid and you need to change and believe like I believe. Yeah, I don't think it's ever changed anyone. Because people are already set in their own ways and we try to come from the outside and bring, facilitate change in our world today. But every change begins within. And so I don't need to argue with people. I just simply say, let's pray. You know? And whatever the Spirit speaks to us on, that's truth because we're opening our lives to truth. I don't need to argue this way or that way, whose view is right or whose view is wrong. Let us both learn and experience as we rest in divine truth and let it unfold for us. Wow. Now, people, I don't want to do that. I'd rather hold on to my opposing views. I'd rather argue. I'd rather wrestle. I'd rather debate. I'd rather fight. I'd rather resist. I'd rather do all these kind of things that create this negative energy in the world. I was like, wait, 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 wait. If we go to prayer and we sit in stillness, allow truth to rise, allow it to teach us. How might our life, our view, our thinking, and our prayers be changed? How might they change us? And how might they change the world around us? Because here's what happens when you pray, when you're in the stillness, when you meditate, when you're in the quiet. Something happens to you. You mentally and spiritually expand. That's right. You're open to all kinds of new things in the divine presence. Why? Because the divine presence is filled with infinite possibilities. God is not limited. God is not in this way saying there are small thinking in this world, but God is full of big thinking, large thinking, expansive thinking, possibilities, solutions, and something happens that's so amazing. When we go to prayer, we are mentally and spiritually expanded. I love this beautiful passage that we read today from uh, the Gospels. It's such a metaphysical teaching for our lives because it explains everything about our journey of prayer. When you pray, enter into your inner chamber. Go within. That is to say the place within you that Jesus calls it the Father in me. I go to the source in me, not outside of me. But in me, I find this divine presence, that love in me. And when I'm centered there, that's how we begin to close the door. We shut out everything else. We close out all the other kinds of things and distractions in our lives. And we welcome this experience to the fullest. And it is there, the scripture says, the spirit will reward you. And that which is done in secret will be there, the unfolding for us for in our lives. Because in that inner chamber, in that place within, in that moment of silence, amazing things happen. And we learn the most in silence. Because why? We're in listening mode. And in that moment, the soul opens up. And we hear the very intuition within us. We begin to experience the great teacher called silence that unfolds for us infinite wisdom. I'm going to tell you, there's so many reasons why people are under so much stress is because they, one of them is that they haven't learned to quiet their mind. That's why we're facing all kinds of stress in our world. We have not learned to quiet the mind, but we're allowing and engaging, entertaining, dancing with all this kind of crazy stuff going out in the world. And we're not willing to quiet the mind to this place where we can really understand the value and the wisdom that unfolds for us from being quiet. 
Prayer is this communing with God, your higher power. Notice it didn't say your lower power. It says your higher power. And that higher is not some place up elevated in the world or in the stratosphere or in the universe as if God is way out there in the higher place. That's why he's called a higher power. But the higher is the higher awakening of consciousness within you, a power that comes within us from a higher level of consciousness and awareness. For God is not in any location. We say God is not uh, anywhere specific. We say there's not a spot where God is not, right? So God is everywhere. So it's not a higher power coming from a higher destination or a higher location. It's a higher consciousness and awareness within our lives that we find to be so strong and powerful when we've gone into the inner chamber, gone within us. We experience it to its fullest. We find the Bible offering us beautiful illustrations for the journey of the soul. Every Bible story is our story. That's why we like them, because they're our story. And today, their story is the story of Daniel. That's right. Remember Daniel in the Old Testament? He was the one who prayed three times a day. He would open up his windows and pray towards Jerusalem, the scripture says. Praying three times a day was his habit, his style. And of course, then those who opposed Daniel thought it was the great way to create some sort of division between him and the great king. So they went to the king and they said, oh, king, let it be that for 30 days, no one prays to anyone but you. And the king and his egos, wow, I like that. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, I'll sign that into a decree. You got to pray to me. I'm the all power. Everybody recognize me. That's going to be fabulous. I'm liking that. Now, the king and Daniel were best of friends and the king was not fully aware of Daniel's spiritual practice. And so when the decree was signed, Daniel just went on about his day-to-day business, opening the windows of the soul and praying and facing Jerusalem and allowing this time of prayer to be his moment of centering his life for the unfolding of the highest and best in him. King finds out. Everyone else finds out. Wait, this is the law. Daniel, we are breaking the law. The punishment is you'll be thrown into the lion's den. Into the den. Daniel, you realize this is the worst thing that could happen. The day comes, they take Daniel, they lower him into this den of lions. And the king seals the the den off, putting the stone on top, and he's lowered into this pit and kind of says, Daniel, good luck. I hope your God's with you. Good luck. You know, I hope so. The next morning, only to find Daniel is there in perfect condition, untouched by the roaring lion. He's removed, and those who were in opposition were thrown into the lion's den and devoured instantly. Ooh, okay, so there were some hungry cats there. What do we find here? How is this our story? You see, Daniel's habit is what we're looking at that's our story. He went into his house, the scripture says. He went into his inner chamber. You are the house. You are the temple. You are the dwelling place of the divine. Go into your house every single day. When you go into your house, that is this house of the divine presence within you. And he opened the windows in the house to that upper of the upper room, to this higher place of consciousness. He went in. You go in in prayer and you open your life. This divine, infinite wisdom, higher consciousness, this righteousness, this right thinking that shapes your life and molds and makes you. And the word says that he began to look up. You know, the word anthropos in Greek actually means man, and that means to look up. Man in the Greek was to look up. Always having the upward gaze, to having the upward look. Not that we're always walking around looking at the stars or the clouds, but that we're actually looking for the highest and best. That man is innately made and our true nature is to see the highest and best in all things. That's your true nature. This negative nature where we say, well, I see the worst. I see the craziest. I see the terrible things. I focus on the negative. That's not your true nature. 
Your true nature is you are humanity called to look up into the higher consciousness and the unfolding of the divine that's there for you within your life. And I love this. Facing Jerusalem was his position. Jerusalem is very symbolic of faith of the city of peace, the dwelling place of peace. So I love this. You go in, you open your windows of the soul, you upward gaze to a higher consciousness, and you're facing peace. You look at peace. You see peace. You welcome peace. For every prayer is found and grounded in perfect peace. All things are working together for good. That's how it begins. This level of expectancy within your life that says, I expect the highest and best. I'm looking at my Jerusalem. I'm looking at peace. I'm looking at the perfection of God's unfolding of all this good for my heart and for my life. You see, one of the things that really happens in our world is we get kind of twisted and out of shape uh, when we're dealing and focusing on all the negative of the world around us. And prayer, what it does for us is it lifts us up out of that fuss and all that strife and gives us the gentleness of perfect peace within the soul. It ha sort of helps us in, to maintain uh, balance and great composure within our lives. You know, those who prayed are people who are more steady, composed, balanced. You've spent time in God. You know all things. But, but Pastor, you don't realize how to... Yes, I know. But well, what about this and what about that? Oh, yeah. Yes, I know. All things are working together for good. The goodness of God is unfolding. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. You see, that composure, that stability, that balance is there for you when you've spent that time in prayer. We quickly lose composure. Oh, here's another one of our stories, our Bible stories. That's right. It's you and me, and we're in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, and the storm's coming. And the storm is tossing the boat to and fro. And oh, my Lord, we're, we're scared. And we begin to, we're going to drown. The sky is falling. Oh, my Lord, it's a terrible thing. We're, you know, it's a horrible position that we're in. Wake up that sleeping Jesus. He's in the boat and he's asleep. Come on, Jesus. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. you got to do something. you got to help us out. Don't you realize? Jesus said, peace be still. I'm looking at Jerusalem. I'm looking at peace. I see peace. My prayer begins in peace. I'm centered in peace. And the storms come. Then he turns to the disciples and says, what was this all about? What are you all afraid about? What was this fear? Don't you have faith? Don't you have faith? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, Scripture says. In other words, Disciples, you've lost your composure because, what, you haven't been in silence, listening, hearing? Because if you were in the silence today, if you were in the stillness, in the quiet, you would have heard. You would have heard, I got this. You would have heard the Spirit of God around you. You would have heard all this coming from the inner voice within you, and you wouldn't be in the boat of your life screaming and hollering chaos and have lost your composure. You would have been, one, who would have been at perfect peace. Let me tell you, there's nothing so unattractive as a prayerless person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in your beauty regime, it's time to include a little cream of prayer, you know, a little exercise, a little this and that, a little tightening up a prayer. It's going to make you more attractive. That's right. Because the prayerlessness within our lives has sort of demagnetized us to the very blessings of life. We've lost sight of the goodness of God because we haven't spent time in the silence, in the stillness, in the meditation, in the quiet, in the inner chamber, with the windows open, in a higher consciousness. Welcoming peace. Suddenly our life is so much more attractive when we spend our time in prayer because suddenly we are magnetizing ourselves to the all good. We're attracting the all good. It draws it out. Uh, it, the prayer gets busy within us, attracting your good to you. It is like a magnet that just 
Here comes your blessing. Whoa, here comes the good. It's coming at you. It's coming for you. It's the divine unfolding for you that's been waiting all along for you to attract, to allow, to let it happen and unfold within your life. Because in the silence, we expand so much in consciousness. We're so aware and we're so aligned. That's right. We're so aligned. We're aligned with the good that's already coming our way. For the God that we know and love and celebrate within us is a God of generosity. Who down through the ages, the very essence of the divine is that God's saying, I have plans for you. And the plans are for you to prosper. That's right. My plan is for you to prosper. That's the higher consciousness. So when we expand, when we open ourselves to it, when we allow this consciousness way of thinking to come, we simply attract the divine prosperity that's always been there and waiting for you to just simply align yourself with what wants to unfold within you. So as I speak to those student clergy down through the years and they keep asking, here's the action. Come on, let's get in there. Let's start protesting. Let's get out there speaking. Let's get out there and preaching. Let's hold some banners and some signs. Let's change this world. Yeah, let's change the world. Let's change the world right here first. Where the true action happens in the power of prayer. Amen.